Kia ora koutou. hello everybody and welcome to Epic Aotearoa Create a Better Future podcast with your hosts Joe Hortai and Brian Osman, who have the privilege to connect with and share the lived experiences We thank you for spending some time with us today and hope you find value in the messages shared. Join us in doing your bit to create a better future. As Abraham Lincoln said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Let's create a good one. Let's go. Tēnā koutou katoa, nū mai, hāni mai Aotearoa, and in this case, indeed, Australia. In our podcast today, we have a very special guest. Yes, we do. One who's walked a path of me, of our people, our rangataki, our youth, aspire to become one day a professional sports person. But there's a lot more than that. Our brother moved from New Zealand to Australia when he was four, but we'll still claim him. Yes, we will. <laughs> Absolutely. A student athlete of St. Joseph's uh, Nudgy College in Brisbane. Our guest joined the Brisbane Broncos in the under-20 program before playing the Auckland Nines in 2016. His time with the Broncos also included playing State of Origin at that level. Then he went on to serve a church mission of faith and service before returning to resume his footballing career. In 2016, he switched codes from Rugby League to Rugby Union as a ball running back row with the Queensland Reds in the Super Rugby competition, spending a couple of years with the Reds before becoming a Wallaby. Indeed, Australian international rugby player number 919 making his debut versus world number two at the time, Ireland. In 2019, he moved to play professional club footy with Montpellier Herald, I think is how you pronounce it, rugby in France. I'm sure Caleb will be able to correct me. Mm -hmm. uh, before calling time in his football career at age 27 to start his own business as a personal performance coach for entrepreneurs, business owners, executives, pro athletes, and becoming a thought leader and speaker in this space. He also runs a Facebook group that aims to help men reach their potential in all areas of their life. Above all, the sporting accolades, it is fair to say that he is a first and foremost a man of faith, a devoted husband and father, a family man, a man of service, and someone who is able to play the sport at the highest level. Ladies and gentlemen, Aotearoa, Australia, welcoming the one and only Caleb Timu. Welcome, brother. Welcome hey, to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Brian. Joe, appreciate it, man. <laughs> Honored to be on your podcast, so thank you for having me. Beautiful. Hey, I tell you what, Caleb, it's, um, let's jump straight in, and, um, and I'm sure uh, our listeners will want to, to hear and, um, about your, your footballing career. And then what we're going to do is explore how you took a break mm. and explored your, your mission of faith and service, and then what you're doing now. So what was the driving force? And I want to kick off with this because a lot of our um, Polynesian brothers and sisters, they, they, they love playing sport, right? But what was your driving force for playing league or union? Yeah, it was just the enjoyment, man. I, I started when I was eight years old when I came over to Australia and, um, you know, being from New Zealand, rugby was always, you know, watched in my home. We always watched the All Blacks and um, my mother, she's from Wellington, so she's a Kane supporter. So we, we watched a lot of the, we watched a lot of rugby, man. Um, so it was just, oh, yeah. yeah, just the enjoyment watching it. And then when I started to play at eight, um, I just fought, fell in love, and mm. it was just something that I enjoy doing every weekend. Um, and I pretty much did it for yeah most of my life. <laughs> so yeah, it started at a young age, um, but being around parents um, that you know really always watched it and then started playing it, yeah, I started to love it. Awesome. Hey, Caleb, can I can I ask, thanks for sharing that, and it's a privilege for both Brian and I to have you on the podcast, brother. Did you ever, when did you feel like that, man, I, I could do this professionally? Was there ever a point as you were growing up and playing mm. where something just triggered in your head? Maybe it was a conversation with coaches or with family, or was it just intrinsic in you and you thought, man, I can do this professionally? Well, can you talk us through how that happened or how that came about yeah i think it just i can't remember like a distinct moment but i mm. think during the time of um probably in high school i'll say high school when um i got a scholarship to like the local state school their rugby league program right. and i was like man and I, and I watched my dad my dad worked in a warehouse his whole life and he had a lot of back problems and i was, I was thinking to myself mm. like, I, I do not want to go down that route 
And like I've got a bit going here with with footy, with rugby, with rugby league at the time. Yeah. Uh, man, I want to give it a good crack so I can actually make you know I can hopefully make a living out of this in the future. So, um, yeah. you know I can provide for my family, whatever else. And so it started then, man. I think just having a little bit of success as a as a young kid, and then seeing it as like a as an opportunity, I guess, to actually make a living. Um, mm. It just yeah, f- kind of fueled the fire in me to to try and make it a possibility. That's awesome. Were, were there any were there particular coaches or mentors that you had coming up through those ranks and those junior programs that that really helped you gain more confidence? Yeah, there, there was a, a man called Grant Stevenson, and he was my high school coach. Grant. He coached me when I was yep. uh, probably about 15, 16, 17. And he was someone that just really, um, yeah, bred a lot of confidence into me. Um, he knew my strengths, and he really helped me to tap into those um, on the ga- on the field and so he's one person that comes to mind that you know I feel like man he was he mm. was cool and I still keep in touch to him to this day <laughs> oh beautiful <laughs> bro I, I've got to ask and that, yeah. this is this is absolutely wonderful and I'm really pleased to hear that your mum is from Wellington yeah. and a, a staunch hurricane <laughs> supporter yeah. you don't know how that makes me feel bro <laughs> but uh <laughs> We, we we all have our flaws. Yeah, eh? we all have our flaws, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I have to ask because we did have on on our show uh, a, a few weeks ago, um, Coach Natu Tafalu. He's a um, uh, NBL basketball yep. coach in New Zealand and um, coach at, at real high levels and so forth. But uh, he talked about his parents, particularly his mum, uh, and how she would support him on this <clears throat> sideline <laughs> support. Yeah. But, so I'm wondering, you know, what was your family support like when when you to come and watch your games and, and, and so forth? Yeah, oh, it was huge, man. My my parents, my aunties, uncles, cousins, yeah. but they all came down. So we, it was it was cool. <laughs> I, and even my grandparents. Sorry, my grandparents used, used to come to my games. So oh, well, I, I think that also that helped me a lot because when I'd see them, I was like, man, I'm gonna put on the show. Like I'm, mm. I wanna. They really pushed me to to play my best. So. I feel really blessed to <laughs> just thinking about it. Sometimes I forget how yeah. supportive my family really are and were during that time. Um, mm. And so, yeah, they've, they've, they've always been my number one supporters. That's oh, awesome. Man. Were they, were they uh, aggressive on the sideline, telling the refs off and telling you off? <laughs> um, <laughs> what are you doing then? Right yeah. <laughs> now they, yeah. And I telling mine's... your coach off. So yeah. they'll tell... They'll tell your coach off. They'll tell the ref off. They'll tell you off. Did they do all of that for you? <laughs> I think they just told. They just told me off. They were, I remember my aunties were pretty vocal. My aunties are really vocal, man. Um, you could always, I could always hear them when I was on the field. But uh, nah, it's crack up. Yeah. <laughs> Hard case. That's awesome. funny because, like, I, I can imagine, like, when you play sports, right, you, you get used to tuning people out and noise, yeah. but you can always hear the voice. You can hear, hear that one voice, bro. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into a controversial question because uh, um, I'm mindful of this that you've moved from a rugby dominant culture, country, mm. to more of a league yep. taking hold. Which do you prefer? Rugby league or rugby union? Oh, rugby, rugby union, man. Even when I was playing rugby league, I, I knew that my yeah. favorite sport was rugby union and that I would go back to it eventually wow. when I was at the Broncos. It was just a matter of uh, when, not yeah, if. Yeah. And so, yeah, the opportunity came earlier than yeah. probably what I um, forecasted it to come. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty easy yeah. for me. Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, what is it about... Rugby union, because that's great. What is it about rugby union that you that you find yourself gravitating more towards than than rugby league? Obviously, you're skilled and great at both, played at the highest levels in both. But what is it about rugby union that you prefer over mm. over league? I think it's the um, the think the the decision making. There's a little, I feel like it's a lot more. You have to think a bit more with with right. rugby, you know, with the mm. set piece and things like that. When league, it's more yeah, just yeah. There, there is a bit of tactics, but it's just like up the guts. You know, kind of the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Where it's I like high pace, eh? Yeah. yeah. Well, I like the open space. I, I like the different decision making aspects of, of rugby union, which I kind of suited my game. So nice. that's why I liked it a bit better. <laughs> mm. Awesome, awesome. Because I've I've seen um, watched some videos because when we connected on LinkedIn and, yep. and, and stuff, and uh, I was going. Caleb, the name rings a bell, rings a bell, and I couldn't really think why. And then I had to go, and when I was looking at the video, oh yeah, that's why. All right, yeah. And, and I remember, I remember that. But 
um and, and the and your style right and, mm. and the style what, but what they show on, on video is 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 probably the one dimensional which is the bang yeah. bang bang, bang. The, the the hard running hard charging but the, and but there's a couple of times i noticed that they showed the nuances the the passes yeah. the setups the, the assist, mm. that sort of thing which was which shows i guess the maturity of the school set going back to your coaches that that help you through but i, I just wanted to ask this and and i guess it it's when you start to realize that hey i'm 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 okay at this, mm. at what I do, and particularly going from high school and you going into the um, Broncos program, the first time you became a professional sports person, what was that like for you? You're now mm. a professional. Yeah, for me, it was, a, it was a surreal moment when I started to get paid um, <clears throat> for doing what I was doing mm. at the Broncos. And not just that, but it was the level yeah. of training and um, like I'm so grateful for the Broncos that I started my career there because their standard of training and, and of excellence and performance is just so high that um, you, you re- it really elevates you as a person, um, as a player. Um, but it was it was a dream come true. I remember being, you know, I was, what, 17, turning 18 and just thinking, man, living the dream. It's tough as nails, like it's hard as, but like this is what I signed up for. This is what I want to do and, and I'm going to give it a good crack and, you know, try and make it. <laughs> so... Yeah, that was my experience with mm. that. That's beautiful. Wow. What what advice would you give, Caleb? Because I love hearing you share that, and you're mm. so young when you're into that environment. What advice, or what has been some of the best advice that you've received that you would want young and upcoming players like yourself to know when they're preparing or in their journey to to become and do what you've been able to do? Yeah, so you you might be familiar with preseason. Yeah, so that's like the toughest, you know, the, the yep. period of time where you yep. condition your body. And one coach said to me, don't come to preseason to get fit. Get fit to come to preseason. And so I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, that when you can do nice. right. not just what's required, but when you can do the extra to, 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 put, to give you an edge and, um, you know, really prepare yourself more than other people, you're going to be a lot more successful. Um, and so for me, that really showed up with mm. uh, my, phys- my my conditioning. Like personally, I wasn't very fit, and so it was a big work on for me. And so I would get the S and C coach who lived not too far from me, and I'd do extras before preseason even started, and just like smash myself. So when it came preseason time, I was my conditioning was at a better level compared to maybe Good some to other go. guys. Yeah. So mm. I think that would be a big thing for me. Is like you don't don't just do what's required. Like yep. go the extra mile. Awesome. Go the extra mile. Love it. Love it. Yeah, I like it. That kind of resonates with um, with what you do, Joe, and the burpees and moose sweat suffer and, <laughs> oh. and, and pocket. Yeah. Uh, no, no, sorry. Burpee. Sorry, Brian. So, Caleb, yeah. do you, what's the, I wanted to ask this. So what <laughs> is, uh, what's one of the punishments or what's a, what's a dreaded punishment within the professional realm? Say you fellas show up for training late or you're yeah. late to catch the bus or you're late out of the hotel or whatever it is. Do you guys, what are some of the punishments that either your coaches or leadership do or your strength and conditioning coaches give to you or maybe even just internally within your own sort of player leadership group? What are some of the punishments, bro, that you fellas have to, might have to do if um, you're allowed to talk about them? Yeah, so <laughs> some, one of them has been like fine, so you lose a fair bit of money. But physically, um, extras, yeah, right. like, um, have you heard of Malcolm's? Malcolm's? No, I haven't. Can no. you describe and explain what Malcolm's are, yeah, please? So, you you start on the okay so it's a, it's a it's a fitness activity that no one likes because it's so tough but you start on the say on the on, right. the, on the on a line on your on your front then you have to get up run 10 meters drop to the ground get back up run to the far past that line part uh back 20 meters drop on the ground then go back it's just like you're getting off off the ground and up right. just repeatedly you have to do it in a certain time or yep. else you have to do it again um and so malcolm's are a, a dreaded <sighs> exercise um that just gasses you so quickly because you're just having to get off the ground and move so quickly um over and over again so yeah that's uh, that's that's one of the punches and that how I many don't, don't like. that sounds like a burpee with a whole bunch of running yeah, and sprinting in between yeah it's it's like yeah hey. exactly that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not fun <laughs> man yeah it doesn't sound fun it sounds no. like a beep a burpees beep test yeah 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 burpees exactly that <laughs> Yeah, and especially <laughs> yeah when it's in a time when, you have to, <laughs> when there's a time and you have to get it unless you uh, until uh, in case you have to go again like it's 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 really rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, have you 
my last question here before we get <clears throat> Brian come again. Have you been responsible? So is it a one and all in mentality? So like if, if Caleb Timu stuffs up, the whole team's got to do Malcolm's? Or is it Caleb's or Brian's messed up, so it's just Brian's got to do it and the rest of us watch? Nah, it's always a team thing, man. Like if someone stuffs up or someone, um, you know, mm. uh, you know, has a shortcut, then we all have to suffer. So it's like, you don't want to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. You don't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for well, highlighting and, and sharing that, Caleb. Appreciate that's it. all good, man. That sounds, that sounds so cool. It sounds so cool. It sounds so hard. I feel tired already just listening to this for it. But anyway, <laughs> so when you go in the Broncos and, and describe the Broncos and, and those of us that, like particularly down under, right, um, that, that uh, have some affinity with NRL or what have you in some way, um, understand that the Broncos are, are a premier club you know, and the setup and the professionalism around that. But then when you eventually move into rugby union and you go into the Queensland Reds, are we are we talking similar type of professional setup? Because now you're with the legendary Brad Thorne, mighty All Black, I must say, mm. plus Broncos as legend, as well, yeah. Broncos legend, <laughs> a kangaroo, all that, you know, a legend. But is it? <clears throat> I want to talk about Brad in a second. But the in terms of moving between setups, was it similar? Did you feel comfortable moving to the Reds, even though the game is different? Or did the support was the support roughly the same? No, I've, I've the the Reds at that time. Brad Thorne was the assistant coach. They so they had another head coach, and they were going through all right. sorts of rebuilding kind of phase and uh, whatever else. Yep. So the the standard of training was not nowhere near the same as um, as the Broncos when I went across. Um, uh, just wow. the, the intensity, I don't know. Just it's just a different club, different kind of culture, um, and so I had to adapt to that. The, the boys are yep. really cool, like heaps of Islanders and stuff, but. Um, it's just I know that Brad Thorne has done a lot <laughs> since he's um, become the head coach to change that but yeah it wasn't the same when I when I first went across yeah right how did you cope with that how did you because yeah. I, I would imagine that would be difficult you've come from this sounds like obviously very very intense extremely high level professional and yes you've gone to another professional high level environment but you clearly can see that there's a difference in this whatever the standards were how did you cope I, obviously you adapted and and found your space or found your feet within that culture but was that difficult for you to to sort of essentially it sounds like maybe lower slightly what you had been accustomed to being at yeah yeah it was and and for me my mindset too was like i want to get a little bit heavier because i i want to be a bit more because when yeah, i was at the right. broncos i was quite lean um, but as a number eight, I wanted to be a bit yeah. more like of an enforcer. So um, I, I did struggle a bit, man. I, I did. And and even with just the transition yeah. of, of the sports, um, it, it was totally different. I, I hadn't played rugby union since I was um, 17 at, you know, I played Australian schoolboys. Oh, wow. So it had been actually quite a long time. So there's just a lot of challenges that I went through. And, yeah. and the first session that I had with the, the team, I tore my ACL. So it was just a lot, but I, I got through it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Straight away you go into and you have a, a, a significant in, injury like that. that yeah. Is, but then the battle your way back would just show you your, your determination and perseverance. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just, I actually want to explore this just a little bit because I think Joe's touched on something really, really important for our listeners. For those that are aspiring um, sports people or in the professional rank, because now you're changing from an environment, to, um, changing environments, right? Yep. So you we've just talked about the, the physical part of it, but how did you adapt your your mental side of it? Because it would have been easy for someone I can imagine just to go, that's different, that's different, don't like it, don't like it, don't like it, yeah. and then take that negative mindset. But how did you flip that? Because obviously you did to become more of that growth mindset and say, look, it is different, but how can I become better? Is it, how, what was happening yeah. here in, in your mindset? Yeah, well, to be honest, Brad Thorne was a big help for me who really helped me through that period um, <laughs> with my mindset because he had experienced the same thing that I was going through. So um, I, I guess if I didn't have him, it would have been a lot more difficult, but he was really patient with me when the head coach was maybe a little bit, you know, he was like, man, we're paying this guy a bit of money. Like he should have this down pat, but Brad Thorne was really, really patient. He helped me do extras and uh, was really a, a key mentor. And he's also a man of faith as well. So I got to learn a bit about him and he, he was just really, a really good guy during that difficult transition. So he would be a big reason why I also, you know, got through it. 
Um, but I, I guess throughout my whole life, I've always just had a, a mindset that I'm going to get through it. I'm going to find a way. Um, and so, yeah, that coupled with Brad Thorne really helped me through that time. Wow. Awesome. Beautiful that is hear, awesome. Man. Yeah. And, it, and actually, this is a nice segue. So I'm going to jump a little bit because mm. I think there's a nice segue into that. And I, and I didn't actually didn't realize that Brad Thorne was a man of faith. Neither so, did I. Yeah. Yeah. So partway through, I mean, you, at the early stages of your footy career, and I think it's a little bit early when you're in the Broncos, you decide to say, look, <clears throat> time out from footy. I'm going to go serve a mission. Can, can you elaborate for our listeners your decision making, what you actually did? and some of the things you've learned from serving a mission. Mm. Yeah, so at that time I was playing with the Broncos and I was making rep teams and so I was doing really quite good for myself as an 18 year old and so they, they offered me, they tabled me a three year deal mm. um, worth a, a, a good amount of money for, a, for an 18 year old. Um, but mm. for me, my I've always mm. wanted to serve a mission mm. since I was a young kid. And so I, it was a decision mm. that I had to, I prayed about it and just I wanted to make sure it was the right decision for me. Um, and then, yeah, once I felt like and weighed up my options on what was important to me at the time, the mission outweighed the, the contract. And so I yeah made that choice, mm. went, left for two years. I didn't plan to come back to play rugby, to be honest. It was actually, it was just uh, my manager emailed me when I, while I was serving and told me there was an opportunity, so I just took it. Um, but I guess the what I learned from the whole experience um, was that when you have, yeah, when you have a faith and you believe in, um, I guess what the choices that you're making, and you you know that there's it's going to work out at the end, it generally does. Um, and I guess that faith has really been a, a guiding light for me throughout my life. Is um, you may not know all the steps ahead of you. But if you feel like it's the right path, the right direction, just go and, and it'll work out. And I learned so many le- um, lessons on my mission about service, about other people, about work, the world, how it works, um, about myself as a person and um, learned from other missionaries from different walks of life. Like it was a transformational two years that have really helped me as a father, as a husband, the work that I do now. And so... Yeah, those are just some of the lessons that I learned and that like, and I'm really grateful that I did serve um, a mission and that I made the choice because it did work out like, if you know my journey and, and when I reflect, it's like, you know, I, I did come back to play rugby, I had some success, was able to provide for my family and now I'm doing now what I'm doing um, as a coach and um, so yeah, I just feel really blessed um, how, you know, when you have faith in yourself and you, it all just works out at the end. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I'm, <clears throat> I find it actually fascinating because what you have, and, and just to be clear for our listeners, uh, Caleb served the mission for the Church of Jesus Christ mm-hmm. of Latter-day Saints, and you would see him walking around um, like other missionaries would in pairs uh, or, or maybe even threes, um, perhaps door knocking or perhaps traveling in cars, and you'll see them with their little badges on. Um, but they're, while they're um, espousing faith, they're also looking for ways in which they can serve. But as an 18-year-old, <clears throat> You've gone through school and school's structured, right? And it's, it's footy, school, footy, school. Let, let's mm. be honest. <laughs> Sports takes precedence, right? Yep. Footy, school, footy, school. Then we go to the Broncos and it's, it's like 100% footy. Mm. And then all of a sudden, 18-year-old, we, we make a pivot to go serve as a volunteer for our church or for a church, for your faith, right? For two years. I'll, I suspect that in that decision making there would have been some people knocking that decision going what are mm. you doing it's like there's there's money on the table you've got a bright career in front of you did you hear those um naysayers did you hear those those whispers in the background perhaps yeah no they were around how did you react to that how did that make you feel yeah mm. so I, I definitely i saw it on social media um, i heard people you know speak even some of the some of the players and whatever else staff um but I, I guess for me, like I'm, I'm a person that like when I know, when I make a decision and I know it's right for me, it doesn't really matter what other people think. Like they're not going to sway me. Like I might have felt like, I don't know, at the time I would have felt like, oh, you know, a little bit sad or upset. But I knew deep down in my heart that this was going to change my life, a mission, and it was like the right thing for me so I could move forward with confidence. Mm. That's awesome. That's so good to hear that... You know you've you've identified this you've made the decision 
well well and truly long before you reach the age of 18 like you mm. said back when you were little and it's just stayed with you mm. how much of uh an influence or an impact did your did were you did you ever feel pressured or forced to have to go on a mission or was it always just something that you just knew when you gained your own testimony and just mm. like yeah this is what I'm gonna do yeah no it was a, it was a personal was there thing any pressure no my, my parents and my yeah. grandparents obviously they wanted me to serve a mission but um, I've always been very self-driven yeah. like with my rugby with my training uh, with my faith and so when the mission came it's like this is coming from me um, and I'm doing it because I know it's the best choice for me and my, my future. And so, yeah, that's, yeah. that's how I was thinking at the time. Yeah. Not, not no, no real pressure, man. Awesome. Beautiful. Oh, I love that. I love that. Cause it, it does, it does give us a sense of, of balance right? mm. uh, and also gives a sense of you as a, as a driven person, as the one that makes their own decisions and their own pathway. And I guess that's important for our listeners to hear that perhaps yeah. our Langatahi, the, the youth are, are, are are looking to aspire to become a professional sports person that there are other options and there are other things out there you don't have to be steered in one direction i mean you can if you want to but if you know what you want then you can set your goals to achieve those things you, you could achieve more than just being that sports person and mm. be identified as that um so that that is absolutely wonderful to hear I, I, personally but, <clears throat> but also i think it sets you up as you talked about a little bit later on in, into your um your footy success because Talking about the Reds and going back to, to going back to football, um, there's something that I, I really want to to explore just a little bit, and it's the time that you became number nine one nine. You were selected to become a Wallaby, an international rugby player. This is the creme de la creme. You are you are representing your country, mm. yeah, and you're standing there. First of all, one one question is, how did you feel? What was it like? Where were you? when you first got that nod that you, you've been selected mm. and two what was it like for you standing on the pitch mm. Ireland's lining up there your teammates are around you and the national anthem is yeah. playing so I wonder if you could talk to those please Barry. yeah so the first question I was actually I, it was announced the team was announced on Fox Sports so um, I was at a dinner actually at a, at a friend's right. house um, and yeah we are just having dinner there and then we knew that it was coming on so we flicked on the television and um, Michael Checker was announcing, you know, each, you know, all the players of the of the squad of the the June Test series, um, and when I saw my name come up, um, man, I, yeah, was so so ecstatic. I was so happy, and um, yeah, as was my wife. I was there with my wife as well. So it was a beautiful moment. Eh? It was one that I always remember, um, where time almost kind of, you know, stood still for a bit and just Stand felt still. super, yeah. yeah. Still re- just felt really grateful in that time, um, you know, that I was selected. So beautiful. But yeah, that that was my. D- did you have any inkling? Did you have any inkling that you would yeah. possibly be selected? Were there ever any conversations or anything like that, that that had happened with you prior to or anything? Yeah, well, I was on pretty good form the start of the year, um, and you know, yeah, and there was talk and, and whatever else, uh, you know, around the, um, yeah, you know, around the town that you know I was I had a good chance so. I was confident yep. in myself, but then you never know. You know, you could still they mm. they, they have the last say at the end of the day. So nothing's uh, certain until you know they announce it on TV. Yeah. Um, so that was yeah, Man, awesome. that was my experience there. But the second to the second question, um, what it was like standing there? Oh, it was. Oh, it was pretty surreal, man. It was kind of like a dream being there. It was at Suncorp Stadium, so my family all came as well, and they were in the oh, crowd. Wow. And, nice. um, yeah. And just because I started that game as well, I, awesome. I didn't come off the bench. I actually started that game, oh, nice. and yeah, it was just a it was a powerful experience, one that I, I will never forget. Just um, how you know, because I, I in, for me, I, I I like to visualize things, and I, I did visualize these those kind of moments, um, even when I was a, mm. playing at the Broncos, playing at Suncorp and stuff. So for it to be then a reality I was like, man, that's pretty special. <laughs> That is special, all right. And and for you, if I can ask, Caleb, because I imagine there's obviously a lot of footy, a lot of rugby and rugby league being watched in the home. What was it like for you as a young fella to then now be rubbing shoulders with whether it's a wallaby or whether it's as uh, in the rugby league to then be playing against players that you would have been watching, you know, <laughs> and that you would have been seeing them and going, 
yes, I get to smash them now. Or, <laughs> or maybe you got hit and gone, whoa, he just smashed me. No, I don't know if there were any of those yeah, moments. Yeah, yeah. But did you, how, did that, how did that feel for you to be playing against people that you've been looking and I would assume admiring and respecting? Yeah, it was um, it was so cool, man. Like first of all, when I was at the Broncos, and I then got to train with guys like Sam Fade, um, Corey Parker. I don't know, just yeah. some of the real legends of it. Justin yeah. Hodges. I was there when Justin Hodges. I trained with him. Yeah. Um, just guys that you know, yeah. like you said, I grew up idolizing these guys and then watching them. And then yeah. uh, when I was went to play rugby, guys like Jerome Kano, um, like going to get Sunny Bill was there as well. It's just it was it was crazy, man. Yeah. And, and being a, a fan of the game before I you know really started to play it um was you know it was it was pretty special those those moments as well kind of gliding up against these guys and also talking to them after the game too you know i was like yeah, oh crap. yeah yeah so yeah that was That's my experience right. of that. that was uh it was a nice experience and um yeah it's just I, I guess i for me i had to realize that i also earned the right to be there like i it wasn't by chance that i just yeah. ended up on the field like man i had to bust my ass and and work very very hard and sacrifice a lot so i could actually have those experiences and opportunities so um like again just yeah. so grateful Great for, for that yeah yeah that's that's Brilliant. actually really fascinating too when, when you um as joe was just asking that question it just made me think you know you, you the student of the game and i like mm-hmm. this because sometimes we just play uh, and, and we play for fun and that's there's nothing wrong with that right but then when we actually dive deep into them we look at the history and we look at the players and all that that really adds another nuance mm-hmm. or dimension to to the to the sport so i'm wondering when um like obviously as, as you know um new zealand rugby you know there's a lot of those uh, the players are they're put on the pro pedestals and so forth but and sometimes from for their playing abilities rightly so perhaps for their playing abilities um in terms of their personality and stuff, that's a different story. Um, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but when you come across, say, um, <clears throat> somebody that it's a veteran player, somebody mm-hmm. that, um, it's say, from you're playing, I think when you're playing against, say, South Africa or um, a South mm-hmm. African team or a New Zealand team or, or one of the other Australian teams, what was that like? Because now you're kind of in an international competition, but you're not quite international. I'm talking more like that super rugby yeah. space, right? But and you you're playing against a variety of these different players. What was that first time when you when you when you lined up, say, um, a, a player that you recognised that you knew about, <laughs> and then you thought, I'm gonna take him. What, I'm gonna what, smash what him. To, I'm gonna yeah. smash him. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Man, oh, one of the moments was um, actually in South Africa when uh, we were versing the Stormers, and. Sir Khaleesi right. was another team. He was um, he was there oh. at number six, yeah, and yeah. at that time, I oh sorry, I didn't really like I didn't really know how like who he was. Like, I Is that a fine? Would that be a fine in one of your rugby meetings with their phone goes off? Yeah, <laughs> no, <I'm sorry>. yeah. <laughs> it would have been. It would have been. It would definitely would have been. That's a, that's a no go. Right. That sorry, down. sorry. Back to Sir Khaleesi in the South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think he was one of the main. When you when you asked that question, he that came to mind when uh, when we played him and just trying to rough him up and stuff. And um, he's a really good guy, but <laughs> it was a bit of push and shove in that game, which is which is quite funny over in uh, in Cape Town. Yeah, awesome. Oh, did, um, did, so when you did that, did, did you realize? Hey, um, and and you, I think you kind of alluded to this before, but you go, I, I, I'm just. I'm just as good as them. I'm just as strong. I'm just as oh, what have you? Did did that did, did that increase your self belief? Do you think? Yeah, for sure, man. Like it, I, I feel that sports at the highest level is a confidence game. Um, if you lack confidence in yourself mm. and your ability, then you're not going to show up powerfully when you tackle, run, and you set piece. So um, definitely, man. I think of playing against those guys and understanding that I can mix it with them definitely uh, increase my mm. own self belief, my own self confidence. Awesome. Oh, that's awesome! I, I was, I was just thinking then um, when you said that, is that because you're, 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 you're a back row, you're, you're a forward, right? And and we know the forwards, uh, they they just like to muck in and, and so forth, do their job, right? But then they give it to the pretty boys at the back. <laughs> did you ever line up a back? Like, did you ever line up those backs? <laughs> oh, and who? I'm, and who? And who? Was who? It? We want names, <laughs> names and numbers, bro. Names and numbers. <laughs> Man, there was one time in Dunedin, we were versus the Highlanders, and um, you know what's yeah. his, um, um, 
Flip. Why does his name just escape Aaron? me? Aaron yeah, Smith. Aaron Smith. Smith. Sorry, Aaron Smith. And he's trippy. You know, he likes to yeah. talk. Yeah. Um, and he, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Obviously, he's a, he's a world class. He's a world class nine. Yeah. Um, but there was this Hot one energy, time where he yeah. came up when he came out to run, and I was like, "Flip, I'm going to land this gun with smoke him." And he he tried a dummy, but I didn't pull the dummy, and I just I got him. I got him. <laughs> got him. <laughs> so he, that, that's one that comes did to you, mind. Did you do a Quade Cooper, bro? Nah, nah, nah. Did you do a quick crew nah, nah. and just rub his head in the, in the... Nah, I didn't do that, man. I didn't do that. I, I would have back in rugby league when I was playing, <laughs> no, no, no. When I was playing rugby league, but I was really dirty. But no, when I came to Union, I had a bit of sense about <laughs> <of> that. <laughs> Here we go. The truth comes out. Yeah. <laughs> you got him with a good rib tickler then, eh? Yeah. A... <laughs> awesome. This... I like this. And I just want to ask one more question, perhaps around the rugby space. And then before we get into exploring more about what you do, but, uh, mm. um, but Joe, feel free to jump in if you've got some other rugby questions as well. Mm-hmm. But going back to the international into, into Wallabies, Cap, now you're rubbing shoulders with, um, um, particularly in the back row, I, I think you were like paired with um, Hooper and, and Poker. Pocock, yeah. Legends. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. The fetches. And, and then you've got yourself as the, the, the hard the hard nose, you know, back row. How did you find that, that synergy and the energy? Because now you, you've got somebody like Pocock who, who's, who's no, oh. noted for his... Um, his incredible. Uh, yeah. His incredible, um, not only his gifts of playing, but just professionalism behind it prepare himself to get there so what are the what are some of the things that you that rubbed off from these players now that you're in that international environment yeah i what i saw was their attention to detail although they were like mm. one of the best in the world they were very meticulous in their training in their extras and he was still working on um on stealing balls at training like it's not something that he just kind of you know he knows it is good at. he still practices it and or both of them, they're, they're, they're very, very, very good. And mm. even if you look at um, their like, they're they're both one of the fittest guys in the in the team as well. So they really look after themselves and they push themselves uh, to the you know to their limits. But just definitely that attention to detail I saw um, across the board, on and off the field, um, was just so inspirational. And I could see why they are you know both of them are some of the greatest back rowers mm. in Australian history. <clears throat> awesome. I love how you mentioned that and just that attention to detail. And maybe if I'm diverting, Brian, you can just pull it back yeah. here if you need to. But I'd love to, with these experiences that you've gained, that you've learned over the years from all these incredible people and no, be- no doubt others that you know haven't had time to mention and stuff here in our time with you. But I'd love to know how you use that now, maybe migrate or transition into what it is that you do now. And if you could talk us through what it is that you do now specifically, um, and, and detail that in as much detail or as little detail as you like so that our audience can get a bit of an idea and how you utilize mm. some of the learnings and the experiences that you've collected over mm. many years in those professional ranks and still today and how you use that to help. Because it was interesting, I didn't know until I heard Brian mentioning about your, what you're doing at the moment. And so maybe if you could take some time and, and start talking about that because we're mindful of our time with you today, yep. that would be awesome, Caleb. Cool, mm. yep. So right now, like uh, Brian mentioned, I'm a personal performance coach or people like a life coach, mm-hmm. you know, Tony Robbins and whatever else. Yeah. They just try and get the yep. best out of people. And so um, yeah, with sports, coaches, you know, their their whole... Um, job is to help you excel in the field and the work that I do I, I try and, yeah. and I help um, men mostly men um, excel off on, not obviously off the field but in their life so with their businesses with their family their spirituality their own physicality um, so they can perform yeah. at the highest levels I, and I guess with, with in regards to your question so that's what I do on a daily basis it's conversations like this nice. um, I also run workshops and, and online webinars and trainings and I speak um, in schools and churches and other events, um, but the, that's the work that I do. Of, um, like it's a quite a personal one-on-one kind of basis. But what I learned from rugby and, and some of the things that I've taken across um, is a lot of it's mindset, man. When you look at the game of sports mm-hmm. and, and perform at the highest level, um, what makes the greatest um, what they are and what they've been able to achieve is really how they think how they feel and how they can really create themselves to be um, just a real powerful person. And so that comes through failing. It comes through understanding your thoughts and emotions. It comes through 
um, seeing like blind spots and getting crit uh, um, being critiqued and um, so pretty much everything that I learned from sports I, I then can use that in my my practice on a day-to-day -day basis um, just because I've lived it you know I've lived at the highest level yeah. and can understand what it takes plus I've done um, you know I've been qualified through different um, coaching schools and I, I have mentors I hired I've had two at the moment that I that I've hired and paid uh, money to and yeah, it's just all about performance, man. It's, and uh, at the end of the day, everybody wants results physically, spiritually, with their marriage, with their family, with their money. Um, and, mm -hmm. I, and I help people to, to perform, be that person who can produce and create any result that they want. Beautiful, man. Awesome. Oh, wow. That's, uh, yeah. that's great to hear. And, and so in that environment and in that space that you're working in now, is it how has has COVID impacted your ability to be able to do that as effectively as you might like, or has it it's been pretty simple with the use of technology and all that sort of thing? Yeah, I think technology's made it really easy. I, I started coaching when I was still playing rugby in France, um, so it was all on Zoom, and um, yeah. so it's it's really been yeah, yeah I guess a, a business and career path that is you know really suits I guess today's um, you know workplace. It's people are working from home mostly nowadays, hardly people are in buildings. So um, yeah. it kind of worked out well, but in terms of events and stuff in Australia, um, COVID, it's, it's not as heavy as it was before. So, um, you know, I can get in buildings and I can get in front of people as well now, which is, which is good. So yeah, the impact is not, not that, it's not really that bad at all. Yeah, nice. And, and what's been some of, because I imagine there would be a lot, but what have been for you a couple or two or three of the you know most rewarding experiences that you've had in terms of doing what you're doing now as a performance coach as a life coach and helping yeah. the number of people that i assume you you're really working with and helping them yeah. to succeed in life as you mentioned what have been some of the real you know sort of i guess golden takeaway rewarding moments for you caleb yeah well the, the first guy that i coached he he was struggling with his um, as a dad, as a husband, father in his home, and he just wasn't very pre present. He wanted to become more present and attentive, and so we worked for about twelve weeks together, and you know, uncovered a lot of things that were holding him back, and um, you know, just helped him increase his level of commitment in his home and see things that he couldn't see. And so, at the end of that time, and even during it, actually, um, he got to a point where he was spending more time with his friends because he, you know, he didn't know how to cope with his feelings. Mm. To after the time spent together, just loving spending time with his kids, telling his friends no, like, I actually don't want to go out with you guys, I don't want to come over. Um, and his marriage has just taken off and has gone to another level. So just, I think that that would be one of the biggest things for me is actually seeing people's lives change as a husband, as a father. Because you can make heaps of money, man. But if, if your home's on order and if, you're, if, you, if you feel like, man, you don't have a good relationship with your kids, like money doesn't it can't fill that void um so that's a, a big part of the work that i do um and you know that's one of the one of the moments that i that i wow. cherish as a coach seeing that beautiful change in a man yeah awesome Ooh. thank you very much because I, I i'm so glad that you mentioned that sorry brian i'm so glad that you mentioned that because i think there'd be a lot of men and people out there that can resonate with that i know i can at different stages of my life can definitely resonate and connect to that in terms of myself not being present with my family as much as what i could and should have been so thanks caleb that's awesome All sorry good, Brian. Yeah. no absolutely <clears throat> I, I think that was vital that you said that joe and uh, and and um acknowledge you caleb for for saying that and the work that you've done and i just want to spend a, the remaining time to explore that a little bit further as well um the but before we do that i think it's timely as a nice segue into the people out there that are listening to this and you're getting to this point and you've just had a realization you need to talk to this man here caleb so caleb how could people reach you mm. yeah yeah so on my instagram caleb timu one word with an underscore at the end um or my email um caleb timu coaching at uh, gmail.com um so either one of those avenues or even on facebook like you can find me if you search me uh there's not too many other people in the world with my yeah. same name so um yeah those yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can find me there and um, I, I post regularly on my social media accounts and just try and offer as much value yeah. as possible so yep that's where you can find me nice thank I you like that. yeah absolutely so i've got 
I've kind of got a question in my thought in my mind that as you spoke, and, and it's it's kind of about rugby, but it's not. It's really more about the stuff that we're starting to un, unpack now about what you do, because you mentioned that um, um, you spent time in France playing professional rugby, uh, and that was again we talked about that in the introduction. But it's not so much the rugby, right? What I'm really interested in is because I, I did read that you had to, of course, learn uh, français, oui. learn French. So I'm wondering, <laughs> can you can you can you speak French oui, for oui. us? Uh, so I'll, I'll speak a little bit because still I do. can you still go yeah go I'll just then. introduce myself. Uh, bonjour, je m'appelle oh, yeah, awesome. Caleb Timou. Je suis australien. Uh, J'ai vingt, vingt, uh, vingt what, vingt huit ans. Uh, J'habite Montpellier pour deux ans. Uh, mon famille c'est ma femme Pamela et uh, mon fils uh, Kalisi Edward et Monty. Um, oui, c'est très bien. <laughs> oh, bro. What a flash guy. No. <laughs> that's cool. Well, that's like part that's of the extent cool, of man. my French. That's cool. now, now, can you, now, can you translate, tell us, what did, what the heck did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> I just said, uh, my name is Caleb Timu. I'm, um, I'm from Australia. I'm Australian. Um, I'm 28 years old and I have a family. My wife's Pam and I have three boys. Kalisi Edward Monty. And I lived in Montpellier for two years. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, that's man. Awesome. That's awesome. So what was that? What was that like? Because now you are making a, a, a second mindset switch. You're going from league to well actually you're going from league to admission to union to international, right? And then you start to go to France. Now well, I'm thinking France and I'm thinking um, flash food, I'm thinking sun, I'm thinking um, midday siesta, or is that Spain? Yeah, Spain. that's probably Spain. Spain yeah, yeah. got the wrong country. But anyway, you get what I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, right? okay, yeah, okay. Dif different culture. So, how did how did you adapt to that? How did you and your family uh, did you was it? Do you embrace that? Because now we're seeing changes, and this is something that I, I want to just explore just a little bit. Yep. Because those again of those aspiring to be sports people, travel is going to be a, a potential thing. Yeah. So, so, how did you approach that? Well, the reason why we went there was in when I was in Australia playing for the Wallabies, I was never home. I was always traveling. <clears throat> And so a big reason was to be together more as a family um, and also to make more money. So those are the two big reasons. Um, and so we just made it work, yeah. man. When we got over there, it was a total shock. Um, everything was different. We, we couldn't understand what people were saying. They couldn't understand what we were saying. Um, and we had to navigate, you know, just <laughs> banks and, and, and stores and, and school for my son, church even. Yeah, um, so it just it came with a lot of challenges, but like you said to your point, like we we had mm. to embrace it. You know, we had to adapt. Um, we had to learn the language. We had to learn how people how they are and really be understanding of, of them and um, just adapt mm. to their to their country. And so uh, one of the blessings of going to France was actually COVID um, and being together for about two months indoors. Like we had we were locked total lockdown for for about two months, no work, no nothing. Uh, well, we just spent so much time together as a family and it was beautiful, man. So um, obviously we came to a lot of challenges, but by the end of it, man, we loved it. Like my, my kids still say, oh, we want to go back to France and mm. the lifestyle is beautiful, beach oh, and oh. food. And, and obviously the money was good too. So um, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was like my mission. Uh, it was a life changing experience as well. That's cool, man. So good yeah. to hear. Yeah, that is really cool. Because again, <laughs> uh, and I loved how you said that we just embrace and adapt. Yeah. Embrace and adapt. And, and it's having that. And that really shows the, 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 the power of a growth mindset. Because I can imagine it'd be a little bit scary. I mean, moving from New Zealand to Australia, you know, it does hold some trepidation for yep. the first time that, that you do that. But it's countries are similar. right? But then you go from Australia to France, and it's like, whoa, whoa yeah. it's, it's different. But you learn, you embrace it, and adapt it. So I, I love that. I, I want to just swing this back just quickly, and, and I'm mindful that we're going to start to wrap up our, our conversation cool. soonish. But um, <clears throat> with all those experiences that you've gone through, and we, we've touched on this a, a little bit already, but have you noticed that you've drawn bits and pieces from these experiences to help shape the way you are able to guide and interact with the people that you coach now? And if so, what is probably the one thing that you find that that you hold as as your um, guiding star to, to help others? Yeah, cool. Really good point. 
um, yeah, I, I feel like my in my 28 years of living, I've experienced so much, um, and it's it's because yeah, you know, I've made certain choices in my life that's allowed me to experience these things, mm. and it's been blessings like to be able to go on missions, to be raised in in a family, to have traveled the world with my family, to go on a mission, to overcome a porn addiction, which I speak openly about, which has also shaped my life in, in amazing ways and allowed me to serve in the capacity that I do as well. I, I really think the guiding star for me and out of all those things and, and for myself as a as a coach and how I, and how I help people is the understanding that you are always in control. Um, yes, there may be all sorts of different things that happen in your life, um, but you, you will always be the person that, that makes the choices um that leads you to where you want to go or just to some default f future that um that just doesn't make you happy and so throughout my whole life I've, I've always had to make choices um it all comes down to that man i think your life is built upon making the right choice at the right time so the more you can do that and and have people to guide you as well like uh, things are going to work out for you and so you can t you can turn your life around um it's just really up to up to you Man, oh, powerful, powerful, beautiful. Uh, you actually, boy, you answered the question that I was going to ask you about advice that you would give. But I, I think for me anyway, you've just summed that up beautifully in terms of the powers within each of us to be able to control that and have that um, mm. control over what it is that we want to do. You've spoken about mindset and stuff already as well. I really love your honesty and transparency mm. speaking about your porn addiction and stuff like that which i knew nothing about to, by the way until mm. you just mentioned that and yeah, to hear nice. you speak so openly and mention that here i think is going to be helpful for people to understand and know that they're not alone like mm. that they're they're not alone in terms of their addiction or that particular addiction or whether it's drinking whether it's smoking whether it's drugs or alcohol or whatever i think there's a place for that and i would love to because i'm mindful of your time um, we would love to have you back on yeah, to, to yeah. speak about other uh, about other content and things like this, which we know because everything that you're already doing and that what you've just touched on is only going to help continue to create a better future. And so from me, Caleb, I just want to really thank you and acknowledge you for your time today, for hanging out with a couple of little hoary boys like <laughs> Brian and I. One, unfortunately, from Wellington and then myself from Gisborne, which is where you want to come from. But uh, no, we're, we're really, really grateful, man. And uh, I just want to pay my respects mm. to you, to your family, for your wife and allowing you to spend some time with us today. We know that you've got another meeting in about <laughs> nine minutes, eight minutes. But, um, mate, we wish you all the very best going forward we would love to connect and have yeah. you back on again um if that would be all right with you yep. and yeah, just absolutely. appreciate the wonderful work that you're doing and helping to coach and change people's lives in positive ways and thereby helping to create a better future much love and respect to you my brother yeah. and thank you very much appreciate that joe that means uh, means a lot man so thank you very much awesome. thank you and before we as we look to to wrap up this wonderful um actually um hour that we've had together mm -hmm. and share some things uh, uh tell talk or everything that joe said we we definitely want you back to explore yeah. further and, and be able to share your message because this podcast is about creating a better future mm -hmm. um so <clears throat> i want to um, ask you caleb to perhaps any final thoughts or words do you, you want to share with us but as part of that if you were able to share maybe one, two, maybe three things about what a better future would look like for those that are listening. What would those things be? So, just to clarify, what would like what would a better future entail for people in the future? Yeah, yeah. From your perspective and the people that you've worked with, the experiences mm. you had in your action-packed twenty-eight years, what would a better future look like for those people? Yeah, a better future for me would be one where you can tell the truth and be honest every single day. I feel like so much stress and anxiety comes mm. when we cover up things that we're going through, our mistakes, and we can't find peace with ourselves. So first and foremost, a, a future where you can be honest, you can be yourself, you can be, and you can talk about anything, and um, and that really leads to happiness. That'd be the yeah. second point, you know? Love that. You know, the whole the truth will set you free, it's just so true and it leads to at least the peace it leads to happiness um and so living a life and just living a life that you want to live 
um, not living a life for anyone else. Mm. But I, I found so much comfort and peace from actually designing a life for me that I want and not, it's not dictated by anyone else. And that's come through telling the truth. Like, you know what? I, I do want to serve a mission. I don't want to play rugby right now. I do want to coach. I don't want to keep playing rugby. Um, you know, um, I do have a porn addiction. I do need to get rid of it. I do have an anger issue. Like I do need to confront it. And as I've been able to do that, and, and, and that's my advice to everyone else, being totally honest with yourself and what you want and what you're dealing with will just create, you know, a really bright and beautiful future. Yeah. Damn. Powerful, bro. Beautiful. Super Thank powerful. You, yeah, absolutely agree with that. Aotearoa, Australia, we have spent a wonderful hour. It's been raw in, in places. We've heard the, 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 the hard case stories about league and union, the <laughs> dedication it requires to be a sports person. We've heard about mindset and being the attention or having the attention to detail to aspire to the highest levels of your craft. Uh, we've talked about being patient, but becoming and finding ways to harness those, those energies, become a better person. It is okay to fail. And this is what um, you've, you've talked about, Caleb. Failing, but better than failing is to take that failure and learn from it. Mm. And that the sports, perhaps, or the craft, whatever it is, it, it could be anything, not just sports, is a pathway to now. Right? The things mm. and, and things you go through can shape you because you might not be able to see what you couldn't see. And that may take working with others. So, Aotearoa, Australia, you have heard... Caleb Timu. He has been raw. He has been honest. We will have him back. But have it be known that in this hour, we have heard some wonderful insights. Don't forget, you can reach out to this wonderful man. He may be able to help you in ways that you may not be able to see. So without further ado, and as we do on these podcasts, we wish you all the best. Go well. Um, Caleb, thank you for coming on. And Aotearoa Australia, once again, let's go. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, would you mind doing us a favor and letting us know via the comments in our YouTube channel or by emailing us at either joe at epicpodcast.co.nz or brian at epicpodcast.co.nz. That's E-P-I-C-H podcast.co.nz. We'd really love to hear from you so that we can continue to strive to deliver content worthy of your time. If you'd like to support us further, we invite you to consider liking and subscribing to us and hitting that notification bell on YouTube so that you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes as they drop. We also invite you to consider following us on Instagram, Facebook and LinkedIn. Just type in Epic Aotearoa. That's A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. Regardless of your decision, we appreciate your time once again and wish you every success as you continue to work towards creating a better future. Let's go.